All right, everyone, welcome back to another episode from Police to Priest. I am Father Ricks, joined as always by one of my dearest friends in the world, Father Joe. And today, uh, you know, we have experienced so much, not just in the past couple of weeks, with all the things that we've discussed that are very relevant to the Police to Priest topic, law enforcement and ministry colliding in this social ecosystem that we're dealing with, but then the coronavirus on top of that. And there's the uncertainty of what the future is going to hold in so many different ways. And I feel like today is such a perfect day with the gospel reading to explore that and branch out and try and make sense of the culmination of all that we've experienced in a quarter of a year. So with that, we pray that you go in peace to love and serve the world, and be kind to one another. Thank you, Father. Hey, everyone. Great to be back with all of you. Today is the 12th Sunday in Ordinary Time. The Gospel is from Matthew 10, 26 through 33. Jesus said to the 12, Fear no one. Nothing is concealed that will not be revealed nor secret that will not be known. What I say to you in darkness, speak in the light. What you hear whispered, proclaim on the housetops. And do not be afraid of those who kill the body, but they cannot kill the soul. Rather be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in Gehenna. Are not two sparrows sold for one coin? Yet not one of them falls to the ground without your father's knowledge. Even all the hairs on your head are counted. So do not be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. Everyone who acknowledges me before others, I will acknowledge before my heavenly father. But whoever denies me before others, I will deny before my heavenly father. The gospel of the Lord. Amen. You know, Father Rex, this gospel um, is important in of itself, but there's something really important that precedes this passage um, that we're not reading today. And, you know, with Catholicism, we only take certain segments, and that's how the lectionary works. But I really want to point out what the words are right before this verse. Jesus tells the disciples, you must expect to be hated, to be persecuted, to be flogged, and to be handed over to civil powers. In other words, he's telling the disciples, don't expect your day to be all filled with love and joy and fun, and you're going to be called to do some really challenging work. And people are going to challenge you because of that. So don't go out there and looking for admiration of others. Fear no one. And what he is, in essence, saying is you have to look to the next step. Don't worry about this life. Fear what happens in the next one. And if you make some bad choices in the next one, then you're going to Gehenna. I mean, it's it's controversial uh, in that there is... I truly believe more than anything that there is a heaven and eternal life. But for those of us who believe that, there has to be the opposite of that. And Gehenna is the fires of hell. So, and but I, you know, the, the challenge is that I believe that God is an old forgiving God. So who are the people then going to hell? Scripture or theology tells us in the Christian or Catholic world that those who do not believe in God. So even if you make tremendous mistakes, you could still go to heaven if you have faith. So, I mean, that's the the controversy of it. But I want to relate this to why we're here, police to priest. This passage, the one that proceeds, do not or you must expect. You must expect to be hated, persecuted, and handed over to civil powers. You know, when I became a cop in 1980, um, that's a hard thing to do. And police history throughout the United States has been marked with various times and groups who do not like us. And that's understandable. We are tasked with 
the protection and the service of others, but in doing so, we also must enforce the law. And that's where we create a lot of enemies. And it's a hard thing to comprehend. You know, when I started in the early 1980s, the Los Angeles Police Department was considered to be the premier police department in the country, even above New York City. Um, they had invented all these creative, professional ways of, of doing police work. They had a police show, one out of 12. But in reality, um, one of their longtime chiefs, very controversial, his name was Daryl Gates. He created the D.A.R.E. program. He created a whole bunch of stuff. But in 1982, he outlawed chokeholds for the Los Angeles Police Department. He said it was now against the law. It's inappropriate. You cannot use that. And of course, I mean, that's not without controversy. They had a minimum of 20 deaths, mostly African-Americans, killed by Los Angeles police officers using chokeholds. And they used two different types at the time, and they were trained in the academy. I vividly remember uh, seeing the early footage uh, of that type of training. But after so many people died, it became against the law. But that's not the case in most of the, the police departments uh, in the United States. And that's why we're still having these issues. And I, you know, I, I know that for the past couple of weeks right now, ever since George Floyd uh, was uh, murdered by Minneapolis police, I feel like we've been having this conversation for <laughs> more times than I think I have probably ever had since uh, going to Union Theological Seminary, where this was just the standard conversation of the day, where where those individuals were able to to share their experiences with law enforcement and that darkness, I think, that the scripture talks about right now. And what I think about is, you know, with all that we're going through right now, I think many of us, you and myself, like both you being in law and myself having to experience the consequence of law uh, in my own personal experience has been something where I have seen things that I probably would not have seen otherwise. And it was in the darkness. It was in the depths of uh, things that have been forgotten by public discourse. And, you know, what the, the scripture is calling us to do right now is that your life is valuable. Your experience is valuable. What is said in darkness shouldn't stay in darkness. If you have the chance, bring it out into light. Make something of it. Make something positive. And for me, with my pitfalls and stumbles and uh, whatever <laughs> whatever experiences that I've had over the past 10 plus years now of my personal life and all that, I know that what I do in the moment is not so much as meaningful or impactful as what happens after I come out of that hole and the message I'm able to share with other people and to say that, you know, the, the things that we kind of have rejected as a society <laughs> that we don't really talk about too much, we're talking about right now. My goodness, I can't tell you the number of times I overhear my brother and my mother talking about racial issues. That is not something that they've ever talked about before. And yet I find it to be an ongoing conversation where they're, they're literally having a dialogue and a conversation. It's amazing. Well, it's not just your mother and your brother. The whole world is talking about what the American police are doing. And that's a really, really good thing. You know, the tragedy of George Floyd, of course, has perpetuated all the protests throughout the world. And if it wasn't for what happened this week in Atlanta, they probably would be slowing down a little bit. But literally in the midst of all of this, we it happens again. And um, Atlanta is a little bit of a different situation and it could be slightly controversial. But literally you have two, I have to go back to the gospel. The opening line, Jesus said to the 12, fear no one. Cops have so much power, so much control. Fear no one. A police the police department gets a call from Wendy's. Someone fell asleep in our drive through They sent two cops for that, which is absurd. The Wendy's per people should have went out there and say, you know, move away. 
the cops go, they knock on the window, and it appeared uh, the driver may have had something to drink and fell asleep. The call is someone sleeping in a car. So they do Wood's protocol. Um, let's see if you've been drinking. He says, I had one drink. Take the breathalyzer test. He does it. The numbers come up high. Police have a great power. The power is even greater than that power of deadly force or the power to deprive you of your civil liberties and arrest you. The power is called discretion. They get to make a judgment. Should I arrest this person? Should I not arrest this person? Um, And that discretion only applies to non-felony events. So this is, in essence, I can't even call it drunk driving. He's not driving. He's sleeping in a car. So the cop uses his discretion after, after this father of four says, officer, please, my sister lives right here. I could walk here. I could walk here. Cop just goes around, handcuffs him. And then, of course, a struggle ensues. And, of course, um, I get it. You're not supposed to fight the police. I get that. And this young man was able to not only, you know, wrestle away one cop, but two, and grab a taser. And now he's running away. He's running away. His car is there with his license plate. All you have to do is type in the computer, and you know where he lives. Go to his house and wait for him. Where is he going? He's sleeping in a car. But the officer doesn't do that. He opens fire and shoots three times, hitting him twice in the back. I I know. I know that he fought the cops. That's against the law. I get it. It's a... It's resisting arrest, it's assault on a police officer, but it also could have been avoided. You didn't see him drive. Uh, You have to be able to watch someone drive or ask them. And I don't see that in the video, but that's not even the point. I live over here, officer. And you know, to be honest, Father, I was a cop for 20 years. If that was a cop in the car, uh, not only would we have let him walk, we would have driven him home and bought him Wendy's hamburgers. Mm. If it was a female in that car, mm. my guess is discretion would have been used. Okay, you could walk over there. Um, that's the problem, is the discretion we use may be tainted by the color of someone's skin, what they look like, who they are. And that's the problem that we're facing in the world of institutional racism that is alive and well and has never left the 400 years of slavery and oppression that we have created in this country. And I, I, I will say, just based off of what I've seen, I yes, it's a totally different situation, but it's weird to me that there's this distinction where we have such a clear-cut atrocious act in Minneapolis with George Floyd, and then we have this instant, like with... Uh, so many other black young men who have been killed by police and it feels as though it's a distraction without difference. I mean, I, the, the fundamental reason why people got so motivated for this is that it seemed to be such an unjust killing in Minneapolis. And then as it continues, as it does every single week across the country without stop, My goodness, there has not been a week that goes by without a young black man being shot by police for something. And that is the, that I think that's kind of just feeds into the culmination. And a lot of people like to make it about, well, the circumstances, et cetera, et cetera. If it was a white young man, I just keep going back to this in my head. If it was a white young man who, you know, you maybe had an AR-15 or something like that in his, you know, gun-toting, flag-waving American or whatever, you would not have seen that outcome. And that troubles me so much because, you know, I I, I keep thinking back to the protests of the the anti-quarantine folks that were coming out with, with automatic rifles and stuff like that coming out protesting on the steps and all that. 
no conflict, no violence. The only people who died in that was caused by some of the protesters who were carrying those automatic weapons. And so the distinction just uh, sort of exacerbates as we see over and over again. Now that national attention is focused on it, a lot of people like to make semantics about the whole argument. But going back to the scripture, Christ says, are not two sparrows sold for a small coin, yet not one of them falls to the ground without your father's knowledge. God knows what's going on. And God is making it revealed to the rest of us that this is going on. Regardless of the circumstances, regardless of what people have done, every life matters. As he says, you know, <laughs> a thousand sparrows are are less than the life of a human being. And that is something that I think is lost when we move forward and try and bring out some of these examples. And it's frustrating to me to try and uh, make sense of that. And it's not only frustrating to you, it's frustrating to the world. And even me with 20 years experience, I do not believe that most American police are racist. What I do believe is that they are so ingrained institutionally about fear, what to fear, based on profiled training and all that they've been experienced to. But I also think that we have to be hypersensitive now to the needs of all minority communities. Um, hate or prejudice uh, is something that is learned and taught, but all of that, all of that is tied up in this concept of both fear, and that's what Jesus says to us, fear no one, and ignorance, because we haven't been exposed to us. Um, you know, in the early 80s, predominantly, and I'm going to go back to the Los Angeles Police Department, it was all white, even though many of their inner cities um, areas, either they had the very, very wealthy and white or very poor ghetto areas, but they had very few African-American offices and they were the first to start with female officers. I'll give them that credit. But anytime you have a police department that's not reflective of the community they serve, that's where we run into problems. And it's not just African-Americans. It is Latinos, especially the Asian-American community, the LGBT community. It is most importantly women who make up 52% of the American population, and they are maybe 10% of our police departments, all of that has to to be changed. When we talk about defunding the police, we talk about changing the way we do things that have not worked for centuries. Um, it's time to come to the 21st century. It's time to um, hear a new way, a new voice. You know, one of the, the lines in the scriptures is one of my favorite lines of um, all of sacred writings. Even all the hairs on your head are counted. So do not be afraid. Um, and God tells us here to listen to what we hear in the darkness. And my interpretation of that is what, especially for me, what I've seen in 20 years of law enforcement and even with the mistakes I have made and taking responsibility for those mistakes, what you have learned in the darkness speak in the light. And, you know, Father Rick, this is your idea, this podcast, Police to Priest, and we can't be doing it at a more controversial time for police. Um, <laughs> and, you yeah. know, um, it's, but it's important. Yeah. So maybe, you know, our goal in the beginning was to be a guiding light to help officers, and we're still doing that. Um, my hope and prayer is that officers become much more uh, sensitive to the needs of minority communities, much more willing to use that power of discretion to sometimes let people go or go, you know, go after the fact, follow them. You know where they are. We have technology and video and cameras everywhere today. If someone um, needs to get away now to save a life, that's okay. The New York City Police Commissioner disbanded a 600 unit assigned to the New York City Police Department called anti-crime. Um, and it's those undercover cops that infiltrate certain parts of life, and uh, they do some good work, but they also are the unit that's most responsible uh, for civilian deaths. So he reassigned 600 officers and said, we're not doing this unit anymore. Uh, it did some good work, 
but it also did some bad work. That's what we need. We need leaders to stand up to say, this isn't working, let's start to change it. And that, in essence, is defunding the police. And I will just say on a, on a final note on my end, that as I'm thinking about this, I, I think to myself, you know, the, the darkness, right? So many of us have experienced that darkness and that's something that we can kind of relate to. And I'm hoping that this conversation for those law enforcement officials who listen to our podcast, we, we bless you all and, and wish nothing but best. And I think that it's about taking a breath, taking, taking a step back, taking in a breath of life and saying, you know, what, what is truly important? And that is the sacrament of life, you know, in all its complex situations and circumstances. And it, it is a challenge that Father Joe, you have had to face in your own law career. It is something that is entirely prevalent to the circumstances that we're facing. And to give that gift to somebody else, to reorient the way that we think about policing and the the way that we interact with the community around us, give a gift of life, give a gift of light. I mean, something positive in a single spark can totally change not just a person's day, but the way that they interact with everyone else for the rest of that day, the rest of that week, the rest of the month, the rest of the year. It can change somebody. And showing that gift of kindness and love and compassion is something that we need to be lifting up. And that integrates us into our communities, that cr connects souls, that creates relationships. It does all these things that we can't see on the surface level, but really impact every single one of us. I know the officers who I've had encounters with in my life as a white man. Like, you know, there have been some who have been mean. And there have been some who have been nice. And it's the ones who are nice that I remember. It's not the ones who have been mean. And I would I would like to think that this moment offers a reorientation in the way that we understand the relationship that we share with one another, not just for the citizens around us, but for law enforcement and those who try and keep the peace and try and do something to build up a community, which I ultimately think is the goal of all of these protests is let's make this a force for good. Let's make these uh, officers of the peace be officers of the peace to create peace, to create life and love. And the instances I've seen of those actually taking action and taking the, the opportunity of this this tragic platform to transform their organization, their police force into something that can do good. I see that. And it's beautiful. We need more of that. We want more of that. And God demands that of us. And we are seeing radical change like never before. It is normally unheard of for a police officer to be fired the next day or two days after, let alone arrested um, right there for an act done in the performance of their duties. It's unheard of. Uh, but now we're seeing it at every event. The Atlanta police officer fired literally uh, within, uh, by the morning, uh, you're out. And so it, we're also seeing something that's very, very powerful and very different as well. We're seeing officers cross that blue line and denounce, uh, denounce those who are making mistakes. It, it's almost holistic that almost every cop that I've talked to has condemned what happened uh, during the George Floyd tragedy. So that is a good thing. Cops speaking up. That never happened in my day. Um, if anything, you covered things up and you took care of all that. Um, but the world is changing. Um, and really to end with, and we have to be more positive that this idea of defunding the police, we need the police. We actually do. Our world is, um, is sad and tragic and people are suffering. But aside from needing the police, we also need people to have better jobs, a higher standard of living. We have to denounce poverty. We have to help more people to be equal. I mean, uh, on a really good note this this week, which is shocking, uh, the Supreme Court make, made a ruling that said, uh, it's, I cannot, 21st century, um, the Supreme Court said, okay, yes, um, it is illegal to fire someone uh, because they're, they're gay. 
three justices, three United States Supreme Court justices. Well, no, not really. But thank God uh, the high court finally is waking up to saying maybe we have to treat people equally. And I think once that starts to be more commonplace, I think the world um, will follow suit. And uh, police are part of the world, a good part of the world. When And literally, uh, uh, most of what police do each and every day is help people in need. But we have to be so aware of our call each and every day. And I hope my message today was use that discretionary power Give some breaks. Now it's time to to say, all right, maybe this person needs a second chance. And I I think that there is nothing better than the the call for acceptance and redemption. And you know what? It's not going to happen overnight. It's not something that, as we see with the protests, I mean, there have been weeks and weeks and weeks. We're going on, uh, I think we're almost on four weeks now by the time this airs. And to see the 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 calling of the public as a whole to be a part of this movement that doesn't just include the citizenry but includes law enforcement as well we want everyone to be part of this conversation to make the world a better place to make the US a better place and to do our part to contribute to society and do what we can i mean we're going to fall we're going to stumble and that's okay Let's make it a good experience. Let's let's make it a learning experience. Let's grow from this and let's come out of this stronger, as the scripture says, than we did entering in. You know, I want to end with um, the first reading for this week is from the prophet Jeremiah, a prophet who didn't want to be a prophet. And God kept saying to him, you got to do this. His His opening words actually speak to every cop out there. I hear the whispers of many, terror on every side. Denounce, let us denounce him. All those who are my friends are on my watch for any missteps of mine. Perhaps he will be trapped. Then we can prevail and take vengeance on him. Um, It's a warning that Jeremiah is giving to watch out. Watch out to those around them. And, you know, to my brother and sister officers out there, you know, that... Uh, defund the police movement that has us all so scared and worried. Just think about this as as my closing. Um, Two highly trained police officers literally carrying over a hundred rounds of ammunition um, have to go to wake somebody up in the Wendy's drive-thru. That's one of the areas that maybe we can use to defund the police and have like a security force or even just maybe that dispatch caller saying, well, did you go try to wake him up yourself? Um, or we could send an ambulance to see if he's sick. Um, and that's maybe the way to think about defunding the police. And maybe the cops can respond to um, bank robberies or terroristic threats or shootings and not somebody who falls asleep in a Wendy's drive through Brothers and sisters in blue, please take care of each other. Take care of the world um, and, and be safe out there. But remember also that the world needs to be safe. And that's part of your job, too. Amen. Amen. You're listening to From Police to Priest. Please remember to subscribe, follow, like, comment, and share.